to gather for this morning's service, service of worship, service of praise to the Lord God Almighty. I want to share with you an insight that uh, I had this week. <clears throat> Lois and I watched uh, the funeral service for Congresswoman Walorski, and I had a number of insights from uh, throughout that service as it was uh, as it, as it was broadcast, uh, but one in particular came almost the moment that uh, her husband, Dean Swihart, was making these comments. And among that which he said was this, I cannot tell you the hundreds of times that we prayed that her position in Congress was not to be a position for her or I to get a big head, but that it would be used of the gospel to reach thousands of lives. We prayed that while the door of Congress was open for her, that those thousands would be touched. The insight, like I say, that was pretty much immediate, was wondering, even this Sunday, today, as I planned ahead, to gather together to worship the Lord. How many times do we come with that attitude? An attitude that says that we pray. We're here to be used by God, to be used of the gospel to reach thousands of lives. May that be our purpose, our journey, our prayer today. I read from God's Word, Psalm 148, verses 1 through 5. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise Him from the heights above. Praise Him, all His angels. Praise Him and all His heavenly hosts. Praise Him, sun and moon. Praise Him, all you shining stars. Praise Him, you highest heavens, and you waters above the skies. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for He commanded and they were created. Let us stand. This morning, Heavenly Father, we come to praise you and to worship you as we have done so many times before. May it never become so routine that we neglect to remember and to reflect upon that this is our offering to you. This is the offering of the ages that you directed your people to make. It may have come in different ways. The sacrifices may have been accomplished by different means. But this is our offering, our sacrifice to you this morning. And we pray that from the depths of our souls, that it is lifted to you as a meaningful and as a sweet fragrance to be accepted as our humble thoughts and prayers and songs and deeds are laid at the foot of your throne. For we come in the name of Christ and praise you. Amen. There is power, power in the blood.
who are worshiping at home. Good morning. I'm David Hurst and your lay leader this morning. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to First Baptist Church. Uh, kind of refreshing to have the cool morning, although I understand it's a little nippy at boat church, but uh, it's, uh, it's refreshing not to, to uh, be perspiring quite like we are a lot of times. So, uh, A few announcements I'd like to go over. Uh, monthly mission will be... Uh, or Habitat for Humanity, and you can put that on your memo line if you'd like to dedicate for your offering for that. Uh, Diagnose on call. Has there been any changes to that? Does anybody know? Uh, they've been on for quite a while. I would guess they probably have been, but uh, Bob Eber and, and Melissa Judy is what we have here, so... Um, I would thought last week they may have changed that, so. A uh, few things going on. We have the youth convention, August 19th to the 21st, Tippy Valley, or Tippy Camp, excuse me, Camp Tippy. Uh, there's information on there in your bulletin. If you have a youth between sixth grade and, and uh, high school, or junior high or high school, I, uh, there's some information on that. Uh, Kids Club begins August 24th. Uh, that will be in the evening. There'll be a meal, be on Wednesday evening. There will be a meal between 5.30 and 6, a light meal. And uh, also we have the golf outing coming on uh, Sunday, August 8th. That will be at the Rochester Elks golf course uh, if you are something there that intrigues you we also have to I'd like to mention uh, we have uh, we would like to have three to four more volunteers to help Tuesday with the mobile food pantry uh, volunteers uh, we'll load out, come uh, food cars at 10.30 a.m. on Tuesday. That's church parking lot? Okay. Is there any other announcements, Rhonda? Do you have anything else or anybody? 
Got one back. Hey, Susan. Okay, and that was Ruth. Okay, Ruth Allen Furnival. Okay, thank you very much. Is there any other announcements? Ruth Strasser is awake. The tube is out. Drew, Drew Strasser. Ruth, excuse me. Drew, I'm sorry. So there is good progress and good news there. Uh, fantastic. 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 Praise the Lord. Choir will start on Tuesday night. This coming Tuesday night at what time? Six o'clock. So, do we have anything else? We've got a lot to be thankful for. We've got a lot to say today. <laughs> yes, we do. And we've got a lot to be thankful for. And praise, praises to give. And uh, just like to bow our heads now for our, for our offering prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we, we just come to you so thankful for all that you do and all the ways that you have blessed us. We see you work in some of the most mysterious ways. We see some of the, what seems like the saddest situations, but then you're there to turn them into a happy situation. You're there to turn them into a learning situation, a growing situation. Whether it be words from, that come from a funeral or so many things that you just work in such mysterious ways. Lord, we ask this time as we return unto you a portion of this of those blessings we've received. We just ask that you bless the gift and the giver. In Christ Jesus' name, we ask these things. Amen. Will you please stand with us? We're going to sing together. We believe and we fall down. Um, in a time when um, sometimes we're surrounded by uncertain circumstances, um, we serve a God who is good and who is strong and powerful and who is love. Let's worship together.
and he's coming back again we believe so let our faith be more than Holy, 
There is none who is like you. Your power is holy. Your goodness is holy. Your love and your mercy, you are holy in, in every way, completely perfect. Lord, we are so thankful that you are a God who is holy, and in all of the things that you do, we can put our trust in you. We thank you that you have made a way for us to know you, that we could choose to believe, to have faith, to trust. We thank you that we have new life uh, when we believe in you and that we have new life to look forward to. We thank you that you are powerful, that you have conquered death, um, that there is, there is no thing that is more powerful than you that can separate us from you and from your love. We praise you today and we thank you for the work that you have done on our behalf. We want to give you glory with our lives and to share those good things with others. Work in us. Help us to, to do that with the power of your Holy Spirit. It's in your precious name that we pray. Amen. Thank you for those hymns and songs of worship and praise. Thank you for the, the prayer. And I, I should ask to make sure there's no special music. I, I'm not cutting, cutting anybody off, am I? Uh, as I said uh, earlier, we, as I watched the uh, memorial service, I had a number of insights. Um, that were just, you know, would come on, flood, flood my mind, so to speak, at, uh, at various times. And, and another one that I thought of, and it's not only that service uh, this past week, but I wondered, you know, since it was obviously being broadcast in a number of, you know, probably a larger audience than most funeral services, most memorial services, I wondered how many people thought that uh, or wondered what was going on at this funeral service because you know, this, was a, a, this was a sad event, a shocking event. Uh, here, here's a life that was taken in this particular auto accident. In fact, four lives taken. And, and, and they're coming together and, and they're, there were some tears, there was some weeping, at least you know, dur during the broadcast, but met much more uh, other times, I'm sure. Uh, but what's the matter with these people? They're celebrating. They're talking about uh, not an end, but a beginning or a continuation. And like I said, I, this is not the first time I've had this thought because I've been to a, a number of memorial services, I guarantee um, and, and, you know, there is a difference. There is a difference. There is a reason for celebration. We believe. We believe. And all those uh, uh, thoughts, doctrines, if you will, that were included in that, in that song are the reasons for our belief. They give us hope beyond what we normally tip typically think as a, as a funeral service or a memorial service, which people look at as, as the end of a life. And, and it is right to mourn. It's right to grieve for as long as it takes. But and there is a, a, holy, a holy but, a holy something else, and that is we celebrate. We celebrate the victory that we have in Christ. And, and, you know, to place the end at the beginning, you know, here's the question of the day, do you believe? Do you believe? I can't answer that for you. Here in the sanctuary, here watching online, I can't answer that for you. You have to answer that for yourself. But I will say this, that if you do not believe, or if you're wondering what in the world is this guy up here talking about, that God's hand, inviting hand, is wide open today 
And you can change that at any point this morning, at any point after this morning in your life with a simple prayer, I believe. And there are, there are many resources and many people who are willing to help you and support you and celebrate with you that step of faith, that continuation of life into the life that comes after we call a moment of death. Our scripture lesson this morning is from the book of Colossians, chapter 1, verses 15 through 29. And Paul is writing about Jesus. That's who he's talking about here as I begin with verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by, by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation, if you continue in your faith and established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. Now I rejoice in what was suffered for you and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body which is the church. I have become its servant by the commission of God by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. The mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations but is now disclosed to the saints to them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We proclaim him, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. To this end I labor, struggling with all his energy, which so powerfully works in me. Heavenly Father, may the words of your scriptures reach to the depths of our souls that we may proclaim alongside with Paul that it is your power that works in us. And as we gather here this morning, may it truly be a celebration, a celebration of life because life comes from you and those who walk in it have an abundant life. And we thank you, Lord, for your foundation, for your blessings, for your salvation. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. In 1999, NASA launched a robotic space probe named Stardust. Its primary mission was to collect dust samples from the particles given off by the comet Vilt 2 and return them to Earth for analysis. Although unheralded by the general news media of the time, yeah, show of hands, who heard about that in 1999? Okay, just checking. So unheralded by the general news media of the time, this launch and the mission generated a great deal of excitement and hope among the scientific communities involved in these fields of study. This was the first sample return mission of its kind, and if successful, expectations were high that vast mysteries of the universe would be unlocked. <clears throat> you know, it turns out that some scientists 
uh, call comets the undercooked leftovers from the cl vast cloud of gas and dust that formed our solar system. Esoteric, I guess. Eh? If it was possible to capture a comet sample, even just a thimble full of dust, some believe they could answer some fundamental questions about the birth of the planets and the origin of life on Earth. Okay, launched in 1999. In 2004, Stardust entered the bright halo of dust and gas surrounding Comet Vilt 2, survived a barrage of deadly debris that traveled at six times the speed of an assault rifle bullet, and began collecting the particles from the comet. In one article about this stage of the mission, Washington Post journalist Kathy Sawyer wrote, scientists speculate that as little as a half teaspoon of space stuff, her words, will serve as the basis for enormous and far-reaching conclusions about the origins of the universe. That's some big speculation. Two years later, in 2006, the Stardust mission was successfully completed when the sample return capsule separated from Stardust, entered the atmosphere, deployed its parachute, and landed at the Utah Test and Training Range. According to NASA, the sample harvest from Stardust consists of thousands of cometary product, particles. The total mass of return sample is estimated to be approximately one milligram which is less than the half teaspoon or thimbleful that was hoped for, but the samples have received significant analysis since being brought to Earth. Results of the various analyses are available at several websites. Easy to find. Do, just do the search. And I'm sure that they are of great interest to many scientific disciplines. I don't understand most of them. The abstracts are in the, in the papers that were written, but you know, I'm sure that they're of great interest to many scientific disciplines. However, enormous and far-reaching conclusions about the origin of the universe are not among the results of this amazing venture. In the Old Testament, God raised up people that we know as prophets. And there are several prophetic books in the Old Testament these prophets writing their messages from God and about God were not scientists. Neither were the disciples who Jesus called and who walked with him and afterwards spread the gospel. Nor was Paul, who was transformed from a persecutor of the church into a planter of the church following his divine interaction with Jesus on the road to Damascus, Yet each of them, in their own divinely appointed way, had no hesitation when it came to declaring the enormous and far-reaching conclusions about the origin of the universe as revealed by God. As amazing as the human journey into space exploration has been for about six decades now, it cannot compare to the knowledge and insight that Paul was given to pass along to the Christians living in his day and well beyond. The text I just read, Colossians 1, 15 through 29, is one of the great Christological texts of Scripture which lifts up the wonder of creation and the wonder of salvation. Even though the high hopes pegged to the successful return of the Stardust sample return capsule failed to materialize, the ministry of Jesus Christ tells us all we need to know about the meaning of life and our relationship with God. So verses 15 through 18. They tell us who Jesus is. Jesus is our thimble full of stardust. We read in verse 15 that he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Jesus is the human face of God. He appears in flesh and blood to communicate to us the character of the infinite and eternal spirit. In the Gospel of John, uh, chapter 1, verse, uh, verse 14, verse 14, 
It's written, John describes it this way. <clears throat> that uh, the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father full of grace and truth. Ignatius of Antioch, who was a leader in the early church uh, near the beginning of the second century, uh, commented that by the incarnation, God broke his silence. And in more recent times, perhaps a little schoolgirl put it best when she said, some people couldn't hear God's inside whisper, so he sent Jesus to tell them out loud. You know, God was always real and active in the world before the advent of Jesus, before the birth of Jesus, but his will, but prior to Jesus, his will was brought to life by sinful men and women. Yes, they were chosen by him to be his messengers, but they fell well short of God's glory. No matter how good the translator, nothing beats knowing the language itself. So Jesus, who is God, spoke and acted without the need of a translator. Through Jesus, we see God's compassion out loud. Through Jesus, we feel God's power out loud. Through Jesus, we gain a glimpse of God's nature out loud. In verses 16 and 17 go on to tell us, <clears throat> for by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. As creator, Jesus has the authority to instruct us in all matters of life. I repeat, as creator, Jesus has the authority to instruct us in all matters of life. The book of Hebrews is filled with declarations of the superiority of Jesus over the prophets, over the priests, over the angels. He is superior to all created beings. This causes us to marvel at his humility, servanthood, and sacrifice all the more. Paul acknowledges and lifts up Jesus as creator and then speaks to him as the head of the body. Verses 18 through 20. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning of the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Jesus is the head of the church. This church that we're sitting in this morning, church is a few blocks away, church is across the state, and you get the idea. Jesus is the head of the church. Our mission, our work, our love and compassion, our worship and praise all have a Christocentric flow and direction. Jesus Christ, who hurled whole galaxies across the endless stretches of space, is the same Jesus Christ to whom God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell, who is the one on whose orders we act, by whom we have been commissioned, and to whom we give glory. And after making sure that his readers or listeners, whichever, uh, it was at the time, knew about Jesus. Verses 21 and 22 go on to tell us who we are. 
Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. Alienated from God. Enemies because of our evil behavior. We are no friends of God. We rebel, we reject, we persecute the very word of God. The history of the Israelites, God's chosen people, is our history as well. We are at war with God. And this is where humanists and other philosophies get hung up. They attempt to transfer to God the blame for our rejection of God. I reject God and it's His fault that I reject Him. That's what they do. That's what their philosophies are. Look them up. Since God cannot allow sin to coexist alongside His holiness, He judges us for our sinful behavior, our sinful rebellion. Those who fail to see any further become angry at God for His apparent cruelty. Why should God punish good people, they asked. And so in their rejection, they reject God even more and add to their disobedience. Alienated, enemies of God, that is who Jesus reveals us to be. But it does not end there for anyone who has eyes to see and ears to hear. For anyone who sees beyond his or her sinful rebellion. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. Through Jesus we are reconciled to God because Jesus gave himself as the perfect sacrifice that makes reconciliation possible. As we well know from the testimony of Scripture and as is captured in many verses in hymns, I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Alienated, lost, blind, this is the tragedy of our human legacy, but by the willing sacrifice of the Son, we are reconciled, we are found, we can see. You know, even though there was great hope over what scientists thought they could discover in their thimble full of comet dust, the reality remains that what they discovered has little impact on our lives. I didn't wake up this morning wondering oh, what, uh, what impact some comet is going to have on my life. Did you? The way I live and the way you live the way anyone lives has not been altered by the analysis of the comet debris that was returned to Earth. Our lives are not affected by what a comet does. That is not the case with Christ. Our thimble full of knowledge that Christ has already given us very much affects our lives. It demands very much our response. We are told what we must do. So Paul tells us we must continue in faith. Verse 23 begins. <clears throat> After saying that we are presented uh, holy in his sight, he says, if you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel. It matters very much to Christ that we remain faithful. Significant studies and sermons can be devoted to the rich depths of faith and faithfulness, but for the application rendered by Paul in this letter, it simply means to continue to live out loud our belief in God's promises and not wander aimlessly between the instructions of God and the philosophies of man. Continue in faith. 
And then we must serve. Finishing verse 23, This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven of which I, Paul, have become a servant. Now, this is not from Paul. I mean, he wrote it. But the concept, the thought, his action is not from Paul, it's from Christ. From the gospel books of the Bible, we know that Jesus taught and demonstrated to his disciples how to serve in ways that pleased honored and glorified the Father. Jesus did so many things that should have been beneath him. He spoke with and touched people who were supposed to be ignored and cut off from, cut off from, from culture. He washed the feet of his students, the disciples. He allowed himself to be persecuted. All of this so that we could be reconciled with God, so we too are to serve. So continue in faith, serve, proclaim the word. Paul continues his thought, revealing that our service fulfills a particular purpose. I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations but is now disclosed to the saints. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of his mystery, of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We proclaim him, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. In our families, in our churches, in our towns, in our state, in our nation, and in our world, we proclaim and teach the word of God. We are in this place to worship God right here and right now. Because men and women of faith through, throughout previous generations have presented the word of God in its fullness. If it was possible to reconstruct the chain of events beginning with our individual lives at this moment and tracing them all the way back to the resurrection of Jesus Christ, I think we would be utterly and completely astonished. By looking at how the Word of God was passed along in its fullness. That is the power to which Paul testified in verse 29. To this end I labor, struggling with all his energy, which so powerfully works in me. The Stardust mission has come and gone. Even though it was a successful mission that has paved the way for further endeavors in space exploration, studying comets has thus far not offered humanity a lot in the way of improved lives. But studying Christ does. Knowing Christ does. Applying the mission of Christ to our lives changes and consequently improves our lives. In an earlier period of space exploration, American astronaut commander James Irwin reflected upon what he saw and experienced from the confines of the small space capsule in which he and his fellow astronauts traveled. The earth reminded us of a Christmas tree ornament. Hanging in the blackness of space, as we got farther and farther away, it diminished in size. Finally, it shrank to the size of a marble, the most beautiful marble you can imagine. That beautiful, warm, living object looks so fragile, so delicate, that if you touched it with a finger, 
it would crumble and fall apart. Seeing this has to change a man, has to make a man appreciate the creation of God and the love of God. When God landed on earth in Jesus Christ, it didn't seem like much to those whose minds were filled and clouded by rebellion and sin and their own self-centeredness. As these Christological verses of Scripture make clear, though, we have learned everything we need from the mission of Christ, who Jesus is, who we are, and what we must do. As all of the New Testament authors reveal, this one man, Jesus Christ, unlocks what we need to know about God and about life. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but, but now, He has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you wholly to his, in His sight without blemish and free from accusation. What a journey. What a journey. Our closing hymn is going to be when the roll is called up yonder. When the roll is called up yonder. Looking at verse 3 here. Let us labor for the master from the dawn to setting sun. Let us talk of all his wondrous love and care. Then when all of life is over and our work on earth is done and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. As I begin, as I said at the beginning, I was actually starting with the end. Here's the invitation. Not my invitation, not First Baptist Church Rochester's invitation, although it's an invitation extended by us on behalf of the one who makes the invitation, God Himself. God Himself. Let us talk of all His wondrous love and care. When all of life is over, work on earth is done. When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. You see, God wants us there. Brothers and sisters in Christ want you there because that's where the celebration is. And if you need for your own personal life to be placed upon that roll that's sung about here in this hymn, then believe, accept, repent, rejoice in the love of of Jesus Christ himself, who was our sacrifice on our behalf. If you need to make that decision of life in your own life this morning, please share it now by coming forward as we sing or, or letting us know in the church office online through a letter or phone call to the church for those online. If you need to come and humble yourself before him because there's some adversity in your life, maybe something that you're not feeling close to God, trust him. He's still coming close to you. He hasn't left. So return to him. And if you need help to do that, again, the altar is open. As we stand and sing, when the roll is called up yonder, if you need to come, please come.
Proclaim him, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. To this end I labor, struggling with all his energy, which so powerfully works in me. God has given us eyes to see his invisible image in the life and work of Jesus Christ, his Son. Through Christ we have been reconciled with God. Go now to make God's word fully known to others, proclaiming Christ in what we say and in what we do. Be strengthened and encouraged with God's renewing energy and powerful inspiration. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. <laughs> 